retailing the story of the peacock recovered from the wreck of the Lockhart. Arguably one of Australia's most valuable shipwreck relics. And I'll get you to have a guess later as to how much you think they are worth. It is worth. Now the reason I've got you outside here, and I'll apologise in advance, now that the school holidays are over, we've got a lot of maintenance jobs going on in the village. Unfortunately, the tea rooms are closed. We're getting a whole new kitchen put in. There is some work going on in the foyer here. There's an electric hammer drill that's making quite a lot of noise. And it was easier for me to talk to you out here than inside. What we're going to do, though, is we're going to go in. You're going to follow me through. We're going to take you down to the uh, main museum. Where the Lockhart Peacock is Thank you for your visit here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, let's walk in. Just follow me and welcome to Flagstaff Hill. Okay? So come this way. One of our first employees here at Faith Star Hill was a, name, a guy by the name of Peter Ronald. He came out of high school, he was an amateur diver, and he recovered a lot of artefacts which are on display. One of the things he found while diving on the wreck of the Schomburg was a communion set, communion cup, lid. He sat it on his shelf for quite some time until one day he decided to clean it up. And whilst he was cleaning it up, out of the lid of the communion set dropped a one carat Brazilian. Hold me out. Hold me. I'll be cold, cold, 
Folks, I want to give you one warning. As you make your way around the village on the grass areas, please be careful. One problem we have here throughout the southwest is the rabbits. And they do these little scratchings. I don't want anyone twisting an ankle, including me. <laughs> Just if anyone will do it, I will. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit. I'm going to give you another little challenge. We see some flags up on the flagstaff there. And on one side, I'll take them both, they represent letters of the alphabet. Now on one side, the flags represent the letters. F for Fred, H for Harry, M for Mary, and B for Victor. Does anyone want to guess what they might stand for? Not those words, but some other words. FHMV. What did you say? F, F for Fred, H for Harry. FHMV. Folks, where are we? Wagstaff Hill, Maritime Village. Get it every time. Okay, the other side. I for Oscar, P for Peter, E for Elephant, N for Nelly. We're open for business. O-P-E-N, open. So we're open for business. Okay, now. Why do we have two lighthouses here? See that water breaking on the other side of the breakwater? That's part of that reef system that I talked about. Any ship or boat wanting to enter Warrnambool Harbour simply lines up the two lighthouses, day or night, and that is your safe channel into Lady Bay, okay? Now that reef on the other side of the breakwater is now known as La Bella Reef, and it is named that after the ship La Bella, which came to grief attempting to get into the harbour one stormy night, okay? So, those lighthouses, this one too, are still both operational, but you notice one thing, they don't run in the old rotating white light. They now run vertical blue lights. They are more visible further out to sea and in inclement weather. This light flashes once every four seconds. There's the maritime code for Warrnambool, okay? Right.
Kalau tu aku tu, apa sahaja. Bangkit lagi. Bela kita tu, bela kita tu. Beautiful. And no colors in there. Color part of Jagat Tagat Tagat. And then a selfie. अन्न अन्न लेडी एक्सेमिनर्स ऑफिस मुकदमा एक्सेमिनर्स करने बोलेंगे Thank you. 
डॉक्टर तुम्हारे मुँह दे दी ना मुँह दे मुँह दे गस्ती में ये वो लोग क्या नहीं आते मैं सीवीड सीवीड गंदा ही है ना कोई नहीं कुकुने ये वाला गंदा खाना कुने ये वाला गंदा खाना नहीं को ऐ ऐ
अभी मेरे ना ना तो ना तीन तो नहीं मैं कांडे कांडे कोई दीला कांडे कांडे कोई दीला हाँ या 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 इन्हें या मुंह के जगह वे 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 वैडी इन तो कुरुलो इतने के लोग मुंह ऐला दी ना मैं उंगे देखो लाइन में तुम्हें काम रहा है Jadi kaya macam kaya, macam ni antima dah sese. Rules box. Yeah. 
Shorts today. I have to get it. I have to get it. I have to I have to I have to Alrighty, guys. Now I'm just stopping you here. Yes. So we're all aware that this path is very uneven, so please do be careful. And as you'll notice, we have these wooden bits on the side in the gutters. Very easy to trip on, so try to stay to the center of the path okay. as we go down the hill. Now I'm saying that, if you'd all like to follow me down the hill, and do take your time. The village we are currently standing in today is a recreation of what a typical coastal village along the Shipwreck Coast would have looked like in the mid to late 1800s. Now in saying that, not everything here is a recreation. While most of the things down here were created to house artifacts, our lighthouses and the lighthouse keeper's hut and the building adjacent to it are all the originals. They did once belong on Middle Island, just a little bit offshore over there, but being so low lying, couldn't really be seen by boats. And in about 1870, they moved them brick by brick to the top of the hill, because back then supplies were pretty hard to get. You couldn't really just do another building. You had to make use of what you did. Now in saying all that, before this town was settled, this land was the home of the Gunditjmara people for thousands of years. And back then this land looked very, very different. We had no open fields. We certainly didn't have any houses like this. It was mainly huts and temporary homes back then. And this changed when white settlers made their way across. Now, with our volcanic soils here, I'm sure some of you, some of you could have imagined it would have been farmers, the first people here. But of all things, it was actually whalers coming in to hunt the southern right whale. Now, does anyone know why the southern right whale has that name? Yes? the amount of sperm oil? Uh, sperm city. Close. It was the white whale, but it was mainly because it was the right one to hunt. The oil was a good part of it, but it was also, it came really close into shore. It was very slow, and when it died, it floated to the surface. So it was just the best one to go for. And they hunted those whales in boats like that one there, which I'm sure you can imagine is not as big as a whale. So it was a bitty, pretty dangerous thing to do. Had to be pretty game to do that. I can't say I would have wanted. But um, once the whalers had culled the whales down significantly, they stopped coming in and they went onwards. And it was farmers that set roots properly down here. Those farmers came across <coughs> from Melbourne Way and from Portland Way to make use of our soil. And that pretty much forever changed the shape of the land for one reason mainly. And the hint there is 
Does anyone know if there are any Australian native animals that have hooves? Hmm? Not very talkative group. Uh, no, no, they're not. There's not. They yeah. exactly. There are no Australian native animals with hooves. And so the introduction of cattle species like sheep and cows compacted our dirt and changed quite a lot of the topology. Sorry, word escaped me there. The landscape that we have here, um, turning it into the farms we have now, and a lot of the very delicate, I guess, growing plants couldn't thrive in the compacted soil. Now, in saying all that, for the town of Warrnambool itself, we were formed in 1841 and the land was sold in 1847. The very following year, 1848, our first building was set up. Now, you have one building and everything else is temporary <laughs> housing and tents. Can anyone guess what that building would have been? <laughs> A pub. It was the pub before the lighthouse. <laughs> it was called the Warrnambool Hotel and it stood at the top of the hill where the Clovelly Hotel is now. So just up by the roundabout across from us. Now, unfortunately, it has been knocked down since because building codes weren't quite up to what they are today and it didn't last, unfortunately. But yeah, as you can imagine, thirsty farmers, a few sailors hanging around, the pub was what they were after. Although within that same year, we did have blacksmiths, carters, churches and schools starting to pop up. Pretty quickly, we turned into what we are today. Now, the people who came to I guess populate these towns, were settlers across from the United Kingdom. And that journey took a total of 92 days roughly. From there to here? Yes, all on ship. And they had no engine on this ship, it was all <coughs> sail. And they had no GPS, no real maps as we have them today. Back then they used the stars to navigate. And on nights like tonight, we've got a few up there, but not many. And on quite a few nights, you've got absolutely none. So this became a very difficult journey. And for ships like the Lockhart, which we will hear about in our tales from the shipwreck coast when we get round there, uh, they had about three to four days, I think it was, where they had no stars. And so the captain thought he was 150 miles from where he actually was, and he unfortunately ran aground. So between the navigating situations and our very jagged, rocky, rocky coast, we pretty quickly got the name of the shipwreck coast, because I think... The number was around 800 ships that left England for Melbourne and never arrived. All this end up here. We believe to be along our coastline they vanished. We don't know exactly. We haven't found that many ships, but there are that many that left London, didn't arrive here. Where did oh. they call in on the way before they got to Australia? Did they stop somewhere in... Uh, so for the most parts, there were no stops if they could get away with it. Um, they packed for the journey. They had clothes a month at a time. So you had a month's clothes, and then at that month part, you could get out your next month's clothes, and then your month's clothes would go into storage below ship. And once you got to Australia, you got to wash it all. So you were a bit filthy and smelly by the time you got there, let me tell you. <laughs> now, just before we take you on... To see the show, I'd just like to say that we are going to see a tale of creation from the Gunditjmara people, and then we're going to see a tale of the whalers who were along this coastline, and that will all be narrated by Billy Dutton, the man you saw up on the screen, and he is the first whaler to set down boots on our coastline. And then finally we will see the tale of the Lockhart and the only two survivors from that wreck. Now in saying that, if you'd all like to follow me around, I'll take you to your seats where you can watch the show. File in and grab a seat yeah. and just watch out for the little bit. Yeah, thanks. Yeah.
This was a place born of fire. Thousands of years, the earth cools and life gradually sprang forth. In the oceans, tell stories of how the land was created. <laughs> At the start of the Yakin, or dreaming, Fermiyar, the great creator spirit, sent four creator beings to shape the different features that make our country. Now these beings, they weren't like you or me. No. They were giants. But they took on the shape of men and became the first lawmen who had special spiritual and ceremonial powers. To this day, their descendants perform special duties. Now, three of these original lawmen moved to other parts of the country, to the north and west. The fourth lawman stayed in this country. And when he crashed down, his giant body transformed into Tapoff. Butch Bin. What the white fellas called Mount Napier and Mount Echoes. When Butch Bin erupted some 30,000 years ago, molten lava and stone rained across the land. With this mighty eruption, my people, the Gundijmara, witnessed the Creator being reveal himself. Today, you can still see evidence of the great Creator being all across the land. The scoria stones that are scattered across the country, <laughs> they're his teeth. And as you walk through this country, the country of the Bundijmara, look, listen. You can still hear the spoon. Aborigines first saw the tall masts of sailing ships. They lit fires right along the coast to signal to other clans that there were new arrivals coming. The new arrivals were sealers and whalers. If they say so myself, they were hard and ruthless men, not to be trifled with. Well, at first, the Aborigines welcomed them. And what did they do in return? They went to war with them, that's what. Spears and clubs were no match for the whalers, muskets and gunpowder. And the Aborigines were either killed or driven from their country. It was a sorry business. The whalers had come here to plunder these giant beasts and nothing was going to deter them. I should know. I was one of them. And why were we here hunting whales on this isolated, godforsaken coastline? to feed the insatiable demand for whale oil and whale bone on the other side of the world. That's why. of the globe were imported. 
If you were part of the middle class, it was a time of plenty, and a cornucopia of goods from all over the world could be purchased at one of the latest innovations, the department store. In the glittering surrounding of Harrods can be found practically anything from almost anywhere in the world. Ivory woods from the Orient, ebony from darkest Africa, sandwich glass from Massachusetts, coffee from Brazil, porcelain from the Orient. Of all the products available to the well-to-do in the Victorian age, one of the most indispensable was whale oil. Its superior lubricating qualities made whale oil the ideal product to keep industrial steam engines operating. But whale oil was also used on the domestic front. Whale oil lamps lit up the homes of the wealthy and fashionable. It provided a brighter light than other animal fats available and produced far less smoke. Whale oil was extensively used in toiletries, cosmetics and soaps. While whale oil was highly prized, whale bone too was a much sought after product. In many ways, whale bone was the plastic of its day. It was strong and flexible and could be put to numerous uses. Whale bone was used to make buggy whips as well as the springs on which the carriages rode. It was used to make brushes, combs, the ribs for parasols and umbrellas and fishing rods. But it was in women's fashion that whalebone made the greatest impression. To complete the ensemble, voluminous skirts supported by hoops of whalebone were all the rage in fashionable society. Whalebone and oil were luxury products, but the fashions and technology of the day meant there was a ready market willing to pay a premium for them. When I think about those fancy ladies and gents who lived in the